Hail, hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are.
Welcome to Cities Family. We're excited to join you this morning. Through everything that's going on, we are now in the last quarter of the year. Now, my name is Rio. This is my lovely wife, Rachel, and we lead the campus ministry here. Now, hopefully this message finds each and every one of you in great spirits. And what, what, first, I want to just thank you for your flexibility. You know, I know we wanted to meet in person today, but with the weather, uh, it told us otherwise. But the great part is the sun is still out. Amen. So we really appreciate your flexibility. Uh, thanks to everyone who helped out with Samunye last week. It was awesome. The food was phenomenal. It was great fellowship. And everything went awesome. You know, awesome. As well with the flexibility, too, you know, we're also adapting. And during the campus ministry, we had our first indoor gatherings this last Friday. And it was awesome. We had uh, sophomores and seniors come from 7 to 8. And then freshmen and juniors come from 8 to 9. And we saw eight visitors show up uh, overall. It was phenomenal. We had multiple first-time guests as well, and God is really working in a powerful way. So we've been flexible just as much as everyone else has been flexible, amen? And also, just some more great news, too. The Moody Apple welcomed their second child. River Moody Apple was just born just a few days ago. That is phenomenal. Uh, definitely send your well wishes and prayers for the Moody Apples as they have welcomed their second child, which is always a blessing. And then on top of that, Ironically, it is also Chelsea Moody Alpha's birthday today. How incredibly special is that? I don't know. I guess in the future, they will have to try to share birthday. I don't know how that's going to work, but happy birthday, Chelsea. And uh, we are so grateful for the Moody Alpha here in our Two Cities family. And also, just one last announcement, um, the Mac Retreat. Now, we have already have about 300 students signed up from the Midwest, uh, the Heartland area, and even some places uh, in Canada as well for our virtual conference that is happening this upcoming weekend. And today is actually the last day. So hand in hand, if you didn't sign up, today is the last day to sign up. You don't want to miss out on that. Um, and now my wife, she's going to share. Yeah, so for uh, the year 2020, we have decided to come up with a theme scripture for this year to just set our minds and our hearts on. It's going to be in Romans 12 too, and the NIV translation says, do not be conformed by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And for the campus ministry, you know, we have, there is so much going on, but we want to make sure that our minds and our hearts are set on pleasing Christ and being able to imitate that as believers. And so for this year, we've decided to have that as our theme scripture. We're going to go ahead and pray for the service today. And thank you guys so much for tuning in online. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your gentleness and the ways that you meet us just where we're at, God. We're so grateful to be able to celebrate you, Father, today. We're so grateful to be able to celebrate new faces, especially even new babies like River Moody Appa, God. Thank you so much for your family and the way that you have given us other individuals to be able to lean on, get encouraged by God. We are so grateful to be a part of your family. Thank you, God, most especially for your son, God, the ways that he has bestowed his life and just given it as a free will offering, God. Thank you for this opportunity to know you, Father. We love you so much. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Father, continue in a prayer. We just want to thank you so much, God, for waking us up today, God. There's so much to be grateful for, God. And as the election year is coming up, it's a lot of conversation, a lot of things are going on. But we know you are ultimately still in control, God. We, so, we're so grateful for you, God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, just helping us and guiding us through our days and through our weeks, God. Help us continue to keep our eyes set on Jesus as we know the winter is coming, God. But at the same time, help us stay joyful despite the change of the season, God. We're so grateful, God. Thank you to have all four seasons, God. It's so great to see your nature and your creation, everything you've done for us, God. We love you so much, God. Bless our service today. Speak through Colin and everyone else, God. Uh, in your son Jesus' name, pray all these things. Amen. Amen.
shines for all to
Good morning, Two Cities family. Whether you are joining us online, or I guess you are joining us online. Man, I'm so used to my pre-recorded spiel as I dive into this thing, but we're not pre-recorded. We are live in the studio here uh, at, at Josh Dyroot's place. And family, I just want to thank you so much for uh, your flexibility this week. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad to not be sitting out front in the De La Salle parking lot. Although it's sunny out, it would be cold. And you guys already are so patient with me with my runny nose and my sniffles. And it would, be, it, would, it would be a pretty scene if we were trying to sit out there trying to do this live in the De La Salle parking lot. But I want to thank everybody so much for your flexibility uh, in being able to move our gathering for those who were planning on being outdoors. I know now you're in your living room. Maybe you are gathered together with some of the brothers and sisters from your family group. Uh, we're just so grateful for your flexibility. Thanks for being flexible with us. I think this whole season... Right, has just required a level of flexibility that uh, tests all of us at different times. I know even uh, this week as the ministry staff, we we're so looking forward to doing as many outdoor gatherings as we could the month of October, but uh, we've had to change the plans. And although we plan to meet outdoors next Sunday, uh, I think the weather is forecasted to be even colder next Sunday with maybe even some snow. But I really want to thank especially the Minnesotans, the native Minnesotans, uh, who didn't heckle us for being too wimpy uh, and not wanting to worship outdoors this morning. Thank you for your grace. You even were showing us mercy. I know that uh, there are many of you who are like, oh, we could bundle up and we'd have a thermos and it'd be a big event. Uh, that's true. But I'm grateful for your mercy. And we're talking about mercy this morning, amen. So I thank you for even setting a great example of mercy and flexibility as we got uh, to this morning. Family, we are in the midst of a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And what an incredible time it has been. Uh, going through this incredible, radical, countercultural, uh, just inspiring message of what it means to live lives in the kingdom of God. And as we've gone through each beatitude, we've been able to go deeper into the Sermon on the Mount teaching to get more uh, details from Jesus on what it really means to live out these beatitudes that we see. And this morning, we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 and the beatitude on mercy which simply states, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, or they will be shown mercy. And family, as we talk about mercy this morning, I pray that even though these are familiar passages, even though we know the Beatitudes, this is not easy. This is not an easy text. This is not an easy command and direction given to us by our King Jesus. It requires a posture of humility and, and sobriety about who we are in our fleshliness and who Jesus wants us to be. And we know that Jesus simply wants his disciples, as we focus on today, to be people who are recognized as those who are merciful. So family, let's pray together and we'll dive in to the rest of our text this morning. God, it is so good to be together. Family, um, I, I just, I'm so grateful for the family that you have brought us into in this community. Even though we're experiencing this community online this morning, God, what a blessing it is to be a part of your kingdom. Father, I do pray that you will uh, bless our time together in your scriptures this morning. Bless each of us, Father, in our pursuit of being the merciful disciples that you have called us to be. God, these are your desires. They are your decrees. You are our king, and I pray that we will just humbly be servants that please you, that live lives worthy of you, and that we will be the people right here in 2020, Father, in the midst of a very uh, hostile and, and, and um, you know, passionate political season. And with all the things that we've gone through this year in 2020, I pray that we will be citizens of your kingdom that model and reflect mercy to our communities, to our families, to our neighborhoods, and that your kingdom throughout the world will shine brightly in whatever pocket or corner of the world uh, your children find themselves in, that they will reflect you and the quality of mercy. Please bless our time together. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Family, I'm, uh, we're live here in the studio. I can't hear your amens. I can't see your amens, but I pray that you know together we could just be collective and united in spirit as we dive into God's word this morning. You know, mercy is simply compassion or forgiveness that is shown towards somebody who you do have the power, you do have some type of power to, to punish or harm them because of how they have treated you or treated someone else. But instead of taking that posture of retaliation, we respond with mercy, a, a act of grace, of forgiveness, and of compassion. You know, I think as just 
people in general, right? We love to receive mercy. We love being shown mercy. And yet we are always so very aware of when we are not being given mercy uh, to, to ourselves. But receiving mercy is so much different than giving mercy. And yet this is what God calls us to. This is what our king calls us to. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Family, this is really straightforward here from Jesus. If we want to receive mercy from King Jesus, then we are to be citizens of his kingdom that show and give mercy to others. Jesus was radical enough to demand us not even, not to just show mercy to our friends, to our family members, those who look like us, talk like us, dress like us, but his call of mercy was so radical that he challenged and called us all to show mercy even to our enemies. You know, mercy is not just this, this tolerance or this niceness. Remember we had that series last year on Minnesota Nice? This has nothing to do with this idea of being Minnesota nice. Mercy is just a stark contrast to Minnesota niceness or to tolerance or just an acceptance. But it is a concrete action of love of compassion, of sympathetic grace to those who are opposed, those who are in need, those who are poor, those who have failed, those who have sinned. You know, there's a story of a, of a zoo exhibit where a monkey and a, and a lion were living together in the same exhibit. And as viewers would come to this exhibit to see this lion and this monkey living together, you know, the, the viewers would just be astonished. They'd be like, how do you do this to the, to the zookeepers? How, do, how, do you, how did you train a monkey and a lion to live together in this exhibit? And the zookeeper, zookeepers would very calmly just respond, you know what, for the most part, it works really well. When it doesn't, we just get ourselves a new monkey. <laughs> you know, that's, that's life sometimes, right? Like we have this appearance of so many things going right. And, 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 and you know, most of the time we're, we're peaceful, we're merciful, we're compassionate. But then when things don't go well, right, what do we do? Do we just then move on to other relationships? Do, do we just then cut people off? Do we then tear down bridges that Jesus wants us to remain open? You know, in the life of the kingdom, it's not just as simple as getting another monkey. We are called to coexist and to be family and to be brotherly and neighborly, not just to those who we get along with, but even to our enemies. Family, this is a tough passage we're diving into today, and I pray that our hearts are ready to absorb and to take in what the Spirit desires for us this morning. To be merciful. Right? It says, you know, to the merciful is the promised divine mercy that comes from King Jesus at Judgment Day. Entrance is into his kingdom. And this promise, this passage, reminds us that mercy is a fundamental part of a proper love of God and a proper love of our brothers and sisters, of all humans. You know, we're going to dive into a, a, a further teaching here in uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 38 through 42. This is live, so we don't have the pre-recorded verses kind of scrolling on the screen. I just got to give them to you straight. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38 and verse 42. Jesus says, You have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, then go two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Family, this is, this is a tough, tough application, a tough teaching on how we are to live lives that show mercy to those around us. You know, where do we begin here? I like us to think about this idea. We've been talking about a lot, even as we've been going through the Escaping the Beast book uh, together in our family group midweek gatherings. I want us to begin with the idea of justice as we dive into this passage. This, this passage here is talking a lot about justice and how we determine justice in our lives, particularly as those who desire to follow Jesus. You know, justice is simply, it's, it's, it's the core of the world's system for how to appropriately and justifiably treat your fellow man. And behind every attempt to establish justice around the world, there's a standard in which that justice is built on. You know, here in the United States, maybe the standard for that justice would be our U.S. Constitution. If we were in England, it'd be the Magna Carta. If we were in Germany, it'd be the Grundgesetz. 
I don't even know if I said that correctly, but every country, every nation, every culture of people has a standard in which they try to build a sense of justice, a platform of justice for their community, a justifiable means on how we're going to treat one another uh, when things happen or when they occur. You know, as followers of Jesus and citizens of his kingdom, this is a question we have to ask and consider. What do we use as the standard for us to determine what is appropriate and justifiable in the terms of how we treat our fellow man? Because we are American citizens, is it the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, or is it possibly something much deeper? And I think we all know the answer to that. It's, it's, it's much deeper. It's, it's really here, is it not? The standard for which we determine justice as citizens of his kingdom? It's in, the, it's in the kingdom teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. And where is our standard? It's in King Jesus. How do we treat people? How Jesus wants us to treat people. How do we, how do we uh, you know, work through our wrongs and our hurts? By how Jesus wants us to work through our wrongs and our hurts. Despite what we have to fall back on, you know, maybe on the U.S. Constitution or the laws of our society or culture, we have a much higher standard, a much higher calling that trumps all of that. And that is the kingdom message here in the Sermon on the Mount, in the words and commands of Jesus. You know, as Jesus preaches this sermon for the first time, he's preaching to a crowd of predominantly Jews, and as, as, as Jewish people, what their standard of justice would be would be the, the Torah, or the law of Moses that we see unfolded in the books of um, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And the impact of these three accounts and the expressions of the law is quite clear. It was justice requires retribution or a punishment equal, right? In other terms, a punishment equal to the crime or offense that was committed. Jesus steps right into this legal history and reveals both God's intent and constitution for his kingdom on earth and his messianic community. An alternative society where instead of requiring retribution, Jesus reveals that his followers will embrace a lifestyle of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, grace, peace. You know, in Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, this is one of those um, accounts of the law that I believe Jesus is diving right into very specifically and intentionally here in this passage. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, the word says, show no pity. Isn't that incredible? Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Justice required retribution. The Mosaic law was not just about curbing violence. It mandated justice. Show no pity, the law said. A crime required punishment. Jesus clearly in this passage, he intentionally goes right after this heart, this spirit, and directly ends this mosaic teaching of show no pity. He ends it, and he replaces it, family, with the orders that his followers will be merciful. That's incredible. You know, Jesus' words here, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Don't use violence to resist evil. This is so countercultural to what we were taught today by many of our parents, governments, schools, and even throughout many churches around, around the world. Something much opposite is taught. Fight for your fights. Stand up for yourself. Hit back the bully. Don't, don't let people mistreat you and walk all over you. You stand up and you defend yourself. Even in the business environment, the customer is always right. Don't, be, don't let people walk all over you and treat you however they want to. It's your money. You need to demand to be treated a certain way. Jesus speaks right at this spirit. When we are wronged, when we are offended, when we are hurt, to not respond with, with retribution, that we now look for justice in a new way, Jesus' way, the way of his kingdom, which is to show mercy. Do not resist an evil person. Don't use violence to resist evil. Jesus is ushering in his new kingdom, one in which his followers will not live by retribution, but live a life of compassion, peace, love, and mercy. They love God, and their love for God is going to be shown in the way that they love their fellow man. There's four examples that Jesus dives into right here. The first one, concerned with being insulted. Suppose somebody smacks you in the cheek, right? Now, under the Mosaic law, you just smack him right back. But Jesus says, no, no, if somebody smacks you in the face, which would be such a, a shot at somebody's dignity, 
their honor and their worth, to be smacked, right? In, in, in the Mosaic law, it was justifiable to, to smack them back or to give equal retribution for the offense that they had just committed to you. Yet Jesus instructs an action of grace where we are now to turn the other cheek also. You know, Paul, think about uh, the Apostle Paul. He was often stoned by mobless and law, or lawless mobs, right, who weren't, weren't looking to uphold uh, the, the law. They were just attacking him for who he was and the message he was preaching and the life he lived. And he was often stoned by lawless mobs. And yet as a Roman citizen, he could have, he could have pressed charges against them. He could have helped, called the government in to, to arrest them and take them away, which would have been both justifiable and equal retribution for what had just been committed to him. And yet he demonstrates, right? Yet even as a Roman citizen where he could have pressed charges against him, he demonstrated that, that we can take the persecution. We can take the persecution and yet not respond the way just the law requires, but to even go far and beyond, which is to offer mercy. He was in a position of power to have them arrested or jailed. And yet he showed them mercy to communicate Jesus' love for them. And yet at times we know in Acts 22, verse 25, Paul avoids a flogging by appealing to his Roman citizenship. So there was a times that he just let people, you know, treat him how, however he wanted. But through the Spirit, the Spirit guided him to what was appropriate and what would honor God in that moment. Other times he didn't press. Other times he appealed to his Roman citizenship to avoid getting unnecessary punishments. You know, the second point here Jesus draws to is being sued in court. The example of referring to a modern day of roughly like your, your jacket and your, your undershirt. You know, um, as, as Jews, the undershirt was something that you would typically you would sleep in. You'd put something on over it when you go outside. Then you'd remove your outer cloak and you'd have your under, undergarments, which you would typically just wear around the house. Maybe like your PJs, right? Or, or something you would sleep in at night. So when Jesus says, when somebody tries to sue you for your, for your jacket, give him your shirt also. He's saying that you're even willing to go without accepted um, just levels of comfortability in, in your life, things that you deserve to be able to have, you're even willing to give that up to show mercy and to honor the king. A radical reaction to completely different life of the modern day social customs. Third point, forced to support or serve the Roman military. You know, Roman soldiers had the authority to tell occupied people, which would be the Jews, to, to call them to forced labor and to call them to, to carry or, or to work for them or to serve them in some way. And Jesus draws an example here. To, if they called you to work for them or carry their stuff for them for a mile. Can you imagine what this, how this would have hit a zealot who at all times in their fleshliness just wanted to respond back and go to war against the Romans and, you know, to stand up for our rights and, and you know, to just, just to, to respond in a very aggressive way towards the Roman government. Now Jesus is saying, hey, if they forced you to work for them, and they call you to go to mile. Here in Jesus' kingdom, my followers are going to go the extra mile to show mercy, love, grace to their fellow man. You know, in the fourth one here, ask to help others with money. Jesus urges his followers not to demand back what, what one loans another. Jesus creates an ethic of grace again, compassion, love, and mercy. He seeks to create a community of radical generosity. Family, these are not easy topics. And yet Jesus says, you've heard it said, you know, respond this, this way. I'm calling you to live a new way in my kingdom. Question I want us to consider this morning is, would Jesus have a different bar or a different barometer or a different standard to his kingdom teaching in our private life versus our secular life? Could we live one way, you know, in church, one way out in the community? Could we be one way at home and then another way when we're out in, 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 the, in the community at our, at our jobs? That's the wrestle, right? I think as, as just in our fleshliness, we want to try to meander back and forth between, okay, in this situation, I'm going to represent the kingdom. In this other situation, I'm going to demand my rights. In this situation, I'm going to tell the truth and, 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 and show mercy. But man, if this happens at, at the work, I'm supposed to stand up for my company and show no mercy. Those are areas of our heart we have to wrestle. And we have to ask ourselves, is there a different standard of living for a disciple of Jesus to be able to, in one sense of our life, show mercy, and in another sense, demand justice?
right? That's a wrestle, and it's not easy. And family, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not fully arrived there. I'm wrestling in that, in that position right now as your fellow brother in Jesus. I think we would all agree that no, there's not a different standard. That there is no difference of the secular and the private life in terms of living the kingdom life. Jesus and his kingdom calls every aspect into our life, into allegiance to him and his commands and his teachings. You know, it makes me think about this stuff. Could a disciple of Jesus be a, be a member of the Cobra Kai's? Now, I don't even know if you understand that question, right? <laughs> This is a series out on Netflix. I've seen a couple of the, the, the episodes. I'm not giving it my full support and allegiance here. Don't everybody start, you know. It's a drawback to like one of my favorite movies as a kid, which is the 1984 version of The Karate Kid. Johnny Lawrence and Daniel LaRusso. And you know, the battle between, you know, uh, Miyagi, you know, Mr. Miyagi's form of karate and the Cobra Kai's form of karate. And if you remember the Cobra Kai, their, their saying was, you know, no mercy, or strike first, strike hard, no mercy. And their sensei right, would, would call out, you know, strike first, strike hard, no mercy, sir. Now, that's, their, that's right up front. They're not hiding that, that, that theology, if you will, from the Cobra Kai dojo. That's, that's what they're about. We're going to strike first, we're going to strike hard, and we're going to show no mercy. Now, could a disciple of Jesus be a member of the Cobra Kais? You'd have to wrestle with that. Well, I'm not that way, you know, I'm not that way at church, but that's just how I live out in the world when I'm at school. No, no, If we're going to embrace Jesus, we have to be willing to lay everything down to follow Jesus. There's no corner of the world in which, as followers of King Jesus, where we can say it's acceptable to not show mercy. Jesus says we're to show mercy just to those who we like. No, no, even your enemies. Well, what about the people? No, no, even your enemies. How am I supposed to treat my enemies? with mer No, no, not just mercy. You're to love your enemies. Family, this is not easy. This is a hard wrestle, but one in which the first century brothers and sisters didn't just take as some whimsical theology and, oh, yeah, Jesus, we're going to love our enemies. No, no, they took it that Jesus really meant what he said, and they committed to living out the very words of Jesus, even when it was hard. They were going to show mercy. Look what goes down in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, who's this again? This is Jesus. If you're not reading online, you don't have the red letters. Ben, Jesus is speaking here. You have heard it said, Jewish community, right? The world, love your enemy or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. Well, how do we be children of our Father in heaven? Because we all, if we're watching it, we want to be children of the Father in heaven. We want to be known as Jesus' children, his followers, his disciples. How do we do that? We love not just our neighbors, but our enemies. Those who are persecuting us, we don't respond back and retell. We pray for them and we offer them the love that God offers us. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, challenging, challenging teachings here from our King. But what is brought right to the front and center here of Jesus' teaching, what becomes crystal clear and essential for the kingdom of God, is that we must live lives of love. And a universal love, not just for our friends and our family and those who are like us, but all humans. What is brought front and forward here is that we are to live a life of love for all humans. Not just our friends, not just our family, and those who you like, all humans. Everywhere around the globe. Africans, Indians, Russians, Germans. Let's keep going, Wait, all on, just to you, no, no. All humans, every one of God's children. We are called to live like God and to be perfect. It says here, just as your heavenly father is perfect, how is he perfect? Well, he sends his son, it shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those who love him and those who don't. And he sends the rain to bless those who are evil, just as well as he sends the rain on the righteous. Just as he shows love for all humans, we are to strive for that same perfection, to show love 
to all human beings. Are you with me, church, this morning? Can I get an amen from wherever you're sitting this morning? We're to live like God. You know, this phrase, hate your enemy, is not one that's directly stated in Scripture. He's more, uh, Jesus is he's more summarizing some, some, some passages here as opposed to a direct command of hating your enemy. And one of those passages we can draw to is Psalm 139. In verses 21 through 22, David pours out, you know, he's pouring out his heart to God here, and he shares this in Psalm 139, verses 21 through 22. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. You know, this passage here and this pouring out of David's heart here to God is where this idea of this acceptable understanding, perhaps, of, you know, the, the, the fertile ground of loving your neighbor and hating your enemy is derived. But while though it's not specifically stated, Jesus is saying here, you've heard it said. You've heard this passed on to you from somebody. Maybe your family, maybe the culture, maybe it's wherever you've heard it. You've embraced this idea that we are to love our neighbors but hate our enemies. Jesus says that's not okay. That's not how things are going to go here in my kingdom. That's not who I am or my citizens are going to be about. Here's where I believe Jesus is. A neighbor here in this context is a Jewish neighbor, somebody who shares life with you, somebody who shares the same belief system as you. The enemy, I believe in this present context, was Rome. And this enemy, the Romans, were dishing out persecution against the Christians. So Jesus says we've got to love our enemies, not just our neighbors, and we have to pray for those who persecute us. The enemy here is persecuting you, and love means at its very least that we are praying for them. And yet I believe the entire understanding of this passage is in how we interpret love. What does love really mean? Love must be defined not by our emotions, not by what we think is just, but by how God defines love. Are you with me, church? And love is demonstrated by action. That's what, that's what God, God's love is demonstrated to us in his action for us, is it not? He sends the sun and the rain on all humans. This love in action is a pursuing, it's a longing for, it's a working for the good of the enemy, striving for them to become the sort of person that God wants them to be. Is that how Jesus loves us? Absolutely. That's the love and the mercy we thrive and want to just live in? Is God pouring out his mercy into our lives? Why? Because we've blown it. We've sinned. We struggle. We fail. We've, we've, we're, we're in need. We, we, we just we struggle, right? And so we love it when Jesus pours on his mercy into our lives and it just gives us the encouragement to keep going. And yet, we're to give that same mercy to those around us, even those who hate us, who are our enemies, who are They're persecuting us. We're to call to give them love. This is how Jesus loves us and continues to love us today. This idea that we are to live in a way that reflects who God is fills the pages of the New Testament and should be the cornerstone of our lives as well in our communities. God is love. And as kingdom citizens of God, we are going to live lives of love. Well, how do we live this out? This, This becomes... A whole new series, right? We don't have time to dive into all this this morning, but this puts things front and center in our lives and our hearts and minds when it comes to how do we actually live this out? What are our thoughts and viewpoints about war, violence, murder, self-defense, retaliation? Family, these aren't just pockets of our lives where we can say, well, I don't show, you know, I think we should be merciful, but yet have a list of places in our lives where we're not to show mercy to all humans. Are you with me, church? These are the areas of our hearts we have to surrender to King Jesus. You know, it's hard for me personally. And again, I just want to, as I wrestle and struggle through this, it's hard for me personally, in my life, in my spirit, in my soul, to justify any warlike action towards another human being. It just is. When I think about who Jesus is, in the life he has called, life he has called me to, to love all humans the way Jesus loves me, how do I embrace a warlike posture towards another human? When I think of how Jesus lived his life on his last week on earth, where he commands Peter to put his sword away, back into its place, because his kingdom is not gonna, 
We're not going to fight back. We're not going to use methods of the world and fight back the way the world does. We're going to live completely different lives. Jesus looks Pilate straight in the face and says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. But we don't live a kingdom that is of this world. We live in the life of the age to come, and we live that life in the present as though it were now. Prior to Constantine, with very few exceptions, Christians refused to participate in the military because of their lifestyle of war and retaliation and retribution towards others. No theologian or leader supported participation in the military at that time. The earliest followers of Jesus did not enter the military quite often because they believed Jesus meant business and meant what he said in this passage. This is tough. This is really tough. The apostles teach us how Jesus' words were understood and clearly read. When Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, For this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. We follow Jesus. We imitate his steps. And his steps showed a life of mercy perhaps even of pacifism or non-resistance. You know, Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good in Romans 12, verse 21. You know, this idea of pacifism is connected to many of the Beatitudes, a life of peace and mercy, that we're actually seeking those things out on behalf of our fellow humans. It's not a lack of interest or involvement in the community. No, no, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite. It's, it's the hard work of seeking peace, of seeking mercy, of seeking love in our fellow human beings. Jesus teaches this sort of pacif- pacifism when he advocates, turn the other cheek, surrender more clothing, go the extra mile, don't require back interest or repayment for things that you loan out. Jesus, Peter, and Paul were not doormats. They were strong. They were brave. They were courageous and they were bold, yet they displayed and lived a life in a posture of non-resistance or pacifism. They chose to receive injuries rather than injure someone else. You know, there is just certain convictions I feel like personally that I've had to really wrestle with and think about in all the scenarios and the hypotheticals, or what about if somebody was mistreating my family, or what if somebody was 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 bringing harm to me? These are not easy questions, but it's one that Jesus calls us to dive into. In my own personal convictions, I cannot kill a non-Christian. I can't. If the state called me to kill somebody, I'm not going to do it. How can I kill somebody who Jesus has called me to go and win over with the gospel of Jesus? My king has called me to preach and to share the gospel to all humans. How could I then in good conscience kill or murder someone. I cannot feel, I could never kill a fellow Christian for the government. My first allegiance is to King Jesus and to his kingdom decrees. This dominating idea is that Jesus matters above everything else. He calls us to love both our enemy and our neighbor. Family, I don't know where I am, how long we're going. I don't have your amens. I don't have a clock in front of me, but I need you to hang in there with me for just a couple more minutes and we're gonna bring this to a landing family. You know, when it comes to these ideas of, of, of war or of, of murder or of violence or retaliation, it's all, over the, it's all over the Old Testament. It's all over there in all of its divine yet gory detail. It's in there. And for a lot of us to take a posture on these types of attitudes in response to hurts or wrongdoings in our society today... That's where we have to go. We have to go back to the Old Testament. So we got to ask ourselves, what about the war and violence in the Old Testament? Did Jesus, what about, did Jesus know about the Old Testament war and and this idea of retribution and this idea of eye for an eye? Yes, you've heard it said, Jesus says, show no pity. But I tell you something different. Jesus steps right into that Old Testament history and he calls us to a new standard of living. That's precisely the point. He didn't know about the Old Testament. He was right there alongside in those situations. And yet he says, now something is changing in my society, in my kingdom for the rest of time. Yes, one can justify war as a disciple by appealing to the Old Testament. It's clearly in there. But then it begs us to question, how are we reading the Bible today? 
What the Bible does is this. It takes us from Moses to Christ, and then Jesus says, now follow me. That's what he does. Hey, you've heard Moses said. You've, you've seen it happen throughout your Israelite history. But now I'm calling you to follow me. In the New Testament, Jesus isn't put alongside Moses or Elijah or David on equal ground. No, no, no. Jesus is put on the throne. And we are called to listen, to follow, and obey our King. You know, to put a lot of this teaching into practice, I believe it starts with confessing who our enemies are. And it ends with us learning to love them as our neighbor. Until we name our enemies, we will never be able to live out this passage. And it's an area of our heart that many of us just don't want to go to because it's uncomfortable. So easy in our Christian walk, we can say, I don't have any enemies. There's nobody. At, whoa, 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 whoa. Is that really true? What a, whoa, Maybe it's not blatantly out there, but what about those areas of our hearts, those enemies of our hearts? We all have enemies. So family this morning, who is your enemy? We've got to name them. We've got to confess them. We've got to bring them into the light, and then we've got to do the hard work of turning those areas of our hearts over to Jesus. You know, there are examples of enemies that we have. I believe, you know, there are societal enemies that we have. We've talked a lot about in our Escaping the Beast series lately about the, uh, the, the uh, philosophies of patriotism and nationalism. I think just being an Americans, I know I personally have gotten sucked into embracing at times in my walk this idea of whoever's an enemy of America is my enemy. And that's a challenge. Family, I I'm not proud of that. I'm not happy about that. But yet I found myself, I remember particularly early on as a Christian, I became a Christian in 2003. And in 2005, uh, my closest cousin at the time was just 21 years old. He went off to serve in the um, Iraqi war, Iraqi freedom. And his life was taken just after several months of being there. And I remember just losing my, my cousin at that time and how much it hurt, how much I hurt for Alan losing his life. How much I hurt for my aunt and uncle and my, and my other cousins, his siblings who were just grieving. So, and at that time, there was no doubt that in many people's minds, including my own at that time, even as a Christian, that Muslim communities around the world were an enemy of America, and I was falling into that same trap of embracing them as my enemy. And I remember in times where Saddam Hussein's life was taken, just wrestling with some type of... It's a wrestle family, but some type of just... There it is, eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. Justice was served. And yet, where does that come from? Jesus' heart, however Saddam chose to live his life, Osama bin Laden, any terrorist, it, what they're doing, is this, how they're living and choosing to live is despicable. And yet Jesus is still crying out and trying to move in their lives to win them over to his side. And family, he's called us to do that hard work of going into all the nations, even up against our enemies, those who are persecuting us, and take a stand of love and mercy and grace to win people over to King Jesus' side. Paul, right? Paul himself lived out violent threats against the church. And we see him there at the death of Stephen. And yet Jesus was still working in Paul's life as a Jewish terrorist at that time to win him over into the kingdom. And he became, we know, as one of the greatest evangelists of all times. Is God still not desiring those same type of intentions today in 2020? Family, we're a part of his kingdom and that is still the plan as I read scripture. And I, I pray that you do as well. But who is our enemies? You know, there are many different times where it's been different countries that I've embraced as, as my enemy. Maybe as Americans recently, we've wrestled with, you know, illegal immigrants are our are, are enemies at this time. And Christians have joined in at many times to these type of arguments and disputes. Um, you know, for, for some of our black and brown uh, brothers and sisters, it could be white supremacists, it could be cops, it could be politicians, it could be, it could be another white man. For white people, it could be all of these same things. It could be uh, you know, radi radical groups or any way that you feel like you are, you are being mistreated or overlooked. or uh, There are so many. For the Christian Democrat, it's the Christian Republican. For the Christian Republican, it's the Christian... Like, all these different enemies that we want to well up and create in our mind. We're not even getting to 
the personal enemies that we have in our lives, with the people we see on a daily basis, on the street corners, in your office, in your classroom, in your neighborhood, on the road, on Facebook, on social media, journalists, news reporters, the media, authors who write books, those who just get your blood boiling and your emotions all riled up. We're not even talking about all those, family. Who is your enemy? Jesus calls you and me to name them and now to pursue them with love, to win them over as your neighbor. A new radical, new selfless, sacrificial way of Jesus and his kingdom. I wanna ask us this morning, family, how are you at turning your enemies into your neighbors? You know, Jesus' fundamental strategy on winning over his enemies to become his neighbors was by inviting him to his table, or we see at other times, right, family? Jesus inviting himself on over to their table. You know, you think about the tax collectors and the sinners. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, we see in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Chusa became one of, uh, one of the uh, main servant in Jesus' ministry. You're talking about the wife of somebody who was the manager of Herod's household. You couldn't get closer to Rome in the Jewish world than, Chizza, or the, than uh, Joanna. And yet Jesus won her over to be his neighbor. Jesus healed the Roman centurion servant in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus reached out to those who were perceived as Jewish enemies and strove to make them neighbors. Family, are we willing to love those? even who in our community or in America are perceived as enemies? Are we willing to stand out, to live countercultural, and to extend our heart of love and mercy and grace, to win over even enemies that are perceived by others around us? You know, in these different, just heartbreaking scenarios, we've seen so much with, the, with just the social justice and the inequities and and particularly just the outpouring of, of just anger and emotion when it comes to the, 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 the protesting or the rioting. We just see just the, the, just the built-in emotion and the anger and hostility of all the injustices and inequities in our society. And so often we can see things that pouring out on the media and we can see cops taking innocently the lives of black and brown men and women and our hearts hurt. And yet I think so quickly as disciples, we can tend to want to just pray or wrap our hearts and minds around giving justice and mercy to the one whose life was wrongfully taken. And yet in those scenarios, I believe Jesus' heart is breaking for both individuals involved in that. Politicians and the citizens, cops and the citizens, white, brown, black, whether it was just, whether it was unjust, Jesus hurts for all violence. And just as our hearts would go out to those whose life was taken, family, those are areas of our hearts and our lives where we recognize those could be enemies. The way we view certain politicians who are acting in ways that are ungodly. The way we view certain uh, people in positions of authority who are treating others in ways that we wouldn't think should be treated. We've got to identify them as enemies, if they are, and work that through in our hearts with King Jesus and to take a posture of mercy of grace and compassion. This is the hard nitty work of being kingdom followers, of being kingdom citizens. And yet it's not a work that we can take lightly or just brush off as this is too uncomfortable, this is too hard. This is where we are called to embrace Jesus, to follow him and to step into what it really means to make him allegiant over every area of our heart. Family, I pray that we can continue to embrace this life of mercy, that we can look around and identify those areas and relationships in our hearts that are enemies. And instead of pulling back, of burning bridges, of, of responding back with anger or, or, or hatred, that we respond like Jesus would, with mercy, with grace, with love and compassion. In Romans 5 and verses 6 through 8, For while we were still weak, while we were still sinners, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, the unrighteous, the evil, the enemy, and that was you and me, family. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good one, one would dare die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
He forgives those who are crucifying him right there from the cross. They weren't asking for forgiveness. They weren't apologizing. They were gambling for his clothes, and yet Jesus forgave them. Peter reminds us again in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we would follow in his footsteps. Family, I'm so grateful we serve a king who didn't treat us as our sins deserve, who while we were still enemies, while we were still evil and righteous, he died for us. He demonstrated his love before we even wanted it, before we were even asking it, to show his love for us. And now he's called us before our community, before politicians, before cop, whoever, whoever is asking for forgiveness, that we would go out in front, just like King Jesus did, and to lay our lives down in sacrificial love of mercy, grace, and compassion. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Family, I love you all. Let's pray for communion. God, thank you so much for King Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus, for laying your lives down for us while we were still your enemy, while we were still living in complete rebellion against you, before we even wanted a relationship with you, while many of us, like myself, we knew about you, we had an understanding of who you were, and yet I still lived for myself, and I still pursued my worldly, fleshly desires, and in many cases, I'm still wrestling in those same battles today. And, let, and yet, you poured out mercy and you offered your life in selfless, sacrificial love for me on the cross before I even wanted to follow you. And God, I pray and beg that as followers of, of you now, that here in the Two Cities family and whoever is watching this video, we will embrace a life of radical, selfless, sacrificial love. That the fear, boldness, to, have the, not the, to not have the fear, but to have the boldness and the courage and the bravery to be fully allegiant to you, even if that means living counterculturally to our neighbors, to our communities, to our, to our uh, American standard of what's just, that we will put you in first in all areas of our hearts. Please forgive us of our failings. Thank you for your mercy. Help us to extend that mercy to others. Please bless this time of communion to call us closer and closer into full allegiance to you as our King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey there, brothers and sisters. This is Michael Burns, and I just want to close us out with a, a couple of a couple of things and a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first, I want to let you know what a what a great weekend we've had. Now, normally, 
Uh, this is MEA weekend, and normally that means that we have a fall teen retreat every year, and we go overnight with the teens, and they've been doing that for many years. Well, this year, because of you know COVID restrictions and all that, we, we had to adjust a little bit, and we wound up doing a day retreat with the teens yesterday, and it was phenomenal. And I want to give my thanks, first of all, to our teen team leaders for planning that. Uh, the 11th and 12th grade team leaders are Jonathan and Katie Mathurin. Our 9th and 10th grade team leaders are Kyle and Sadie Schwabach. And then our 7th and 8th grade leaders are Ben Gallagher and Mycretia Burns. And I want to thank them and then all the uh, teen mentors and helpers who came out. What a phenomenal day. We started out with a, a great devotional lesson by Ben Gallagher, and then they played all kinds of crazy and fun games, um, you know, just a, a ton of them. Uh, throughout the day, we came and had lunch together, all, you know, socially distanced, and they kept their, you know, for the most part, they kept to what they were supposed to do. And then, then the afternoon, we went out and played a, a game of a socially distanced capture the flag, where instead of tagging each other, they had balls to throw at each other. So it was kind of a combination between capture the flag and dodgeball. And um, there was some more afternoon activities. And then the, the younger teens left and the older teens went back and we had a bonfire and singing and uh, ate pizza. And it, it was just a phenomenal day of bonding and, and memories. And uh, so if you have a teen, ask them about it. Ask them about their favorite part of the day. Uh, it, it was really great couple of announcements I, I want to give to you. Uh, first of all, we have the amazing opportunity uh, near the end of this month to have a parenting and marriage family devotional with Reuben and Barbara Marbury. Now, they lead the downtown ministry in the Chicago Church of Christ. They're an amazing couple in the ministry. They've raised an amazing family, and they're going to talk to us about uh, a whole bunch of things, but primarily love and respect in the family, both in the marriage and with the kids and raising our kids up and how to create a household of love and respect. And the way we're going to do it is their lesson will actually be released on Monday, October 26th, so that you can watch that lesson at your convenience throughout the week. And then on Saturday, um, October 31st at 10 a.m., for about an hour, we're going to have a live session with Reuben and Barbara where we can interact with them, ask them questions, and get uh, further input from them. So please mark your calendars. You'll be able to watch that lesson throughout the week. And then Saturday, October 31st at 10 a.m. will be the live session with them. A uh, couple other quick things. The Stronger Conference is coming up on October 24th. That's Saturday. Now, this is the conference that was going to be live in Orlando all day Saturday, and it's got all sorts of topics. There's, there's, um, there's mental health topics. There are, you know, everything from, from mental health to uh, race and culture and diversity and all, everything in between. Um, but it's going to be kind of the hot button topics of the day. So today, this Sunday, which is October, I got to look down and see it's October 18th today, is um, the last day that you can register for that conference at the $10 price. And for $10, you get access to all the lessons that are live. You can choose which ones you want to watch live. And then later, you can go back and watch all the recordings. And it's going to be a really cool online platform. It's not just Zoom. It's run by St. Rock Media, and it's going to feel like a real conference in a lot of ways. You can do fellowship rooms. You can socially interact with people. You can privately interact with people. You can do all sorts of things like that. There's going to be vendors there. You'll have an opportunity to go in and kind of get in line and speak with the speaker after the conference. So a lot of the things that you can do at a live conference, the fellowship and all that cool stuff is going to be built into this platform. So sign up. It, it, today is the last day at $10, and then it goes up to $15 before the 24th. And then the uh, and you can find the sign up link on the Two Cities Facebook page. Uh, so check that out. Also, uh, the final thing I want to mention is 
a lot of you, in fact, I'm, I'm wearing some of the two cities clothing that the teen ministries had for about a year. And a lot of you have harassed me for a year about when can the rest of us get access to that. And it took a while to break the teens down and, you know, get them to a place of where, where they wanted to let everybody else have access to it. But they finally caved and they're ready to let you do that. And so we've sent the link out that uh, it's on Realm. Uh, and so look for that if you want to order clothing. Just to be clear, it's not a fundraiser. It's just, if you want some of this Two Cities clothing, there's lots of different choices. It's through East Bay. So once you go to that link and order, that's don't, don't contact me if you have an issue or you want to ask questions about ordering. It, that's East Bay, but you can go on and there's men's, women's, children's clothing. Um, it's really high quality, good clothing. Um, so if you're interested, great. If you're not, that's fine too. But check that out in the Realm Announcements because that link now, and let me explain this, is only good through October 30th. Once, uh, once it hits October 31st, the clothing store will be closed. Everything that's been ordered will be, will be printed up and shipped out, and you won't be able to order anymore. So don't contact me on October 31st saying, hey, can I still get the clothing? The answer is, I'm sorry, no, it closes on October 30th. So don't put it off. Get it now. Get some for your kids. Make great Christmas gifts if you want to do that. Um, and check that out. Thanks so much. Two Cities Church family, we love you guys. Have a great rest of your day and rest of your week.